Hey there, friend. If you like what you've been learning here on the Inventory Genius Podcast, then you are going to love my Quick Start to Inventory Genius course. If you're a product-based business owner and you've been trying to figure out how to make more money, create more profit, and just keep more cash, then the Quick Start is for you. It's a minimal investment, and here's what I promise you. In fact, here's what I guarantee you. If you take the quick start and I don't help you make twice your investment back, I will refund your quick start enrollment in full. So you have nothing to lose. The Quick Start Inventory Genius combines every method that I teach into a simple, bite-sized, actionable step, yes, one step, that will help you create more profit and keep more cash in your business. So here's what I want you to do. Head on over to sierrastockland.com and click on the quick start. That's sierrastockland.com and click on the quick start to inventory genius. I promise you this will be some of the best money you have spent all year. Now let's get back to the show. Hey friend, welcome to the Inventory Genius Podcast, where we work together here to make you an inventory genius. We talk about profit, we talk about cash flow, and we definitely talk about your paycheck. Because at the end of the day, it's all related to your inventory. Let's go. Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Inventory Genius Podcast. I am your host, Sierra, and I am bringing you another Profit First guest this week as we're diving into all things Profit First and we're just having um, a Profit First week around here at the Inventory Genius. I know a lot of you either use Profit First, you know about Profit First, you're thinking about Profit First, somewhere in the journey, um, you're hanging out. And I thought it would be really interesting to bring various guests on this week that have a different use and perspective for the same cash management method that we've grown to love around here. So welcome, Joss, to the program. Thanks, Sarah. It's great to be here. And you have your own podcast. Um, and so uh, we will get the information about that at the end of the show and put that in the, the show notes. But if you are all looking, I know a lot of you are very, um, you love to learn with podcasts and reading. So um, pay attention to that and make sure to follow his podcast because it's very interesting. You work specifically with coaches and let's dive into that that and talk about how that relates to profit first. Give us all the details. What's your story? Oh, goodness gracious. Uh, let's see. We only have so long here. So the short, shortish version of my story is I was always that kid in school that people would grab in the hallway and say, you know, Hey, Joss, can I talk to you? Um, I need, I need some advice on something. And it got yep. to the point by in high school, I was having people calling my house at two, three o'clock in the morning on school nights, uh, which Good and bad drove my parents yeah. nuts to the point that they actually got me my own phone line. So I was okay. cool as a teenager, right? So you're like the in-resident coach for, yeah. for the school gang, huh? Something like oh. that. People I didn't know, like from towns away would call oh, and be like, you don't know me. It's three o'clock in the morning, but so-and-so is a friend. Like by the third or fourth name in question. the list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. And it's like, okay, fine. Hold on. So, um, so I started doing that. And then uh, join, I grew up in Alaska, so I was cold and snowy all the time. And I joined the army to get out of Alaskan winters. And um, I was trained to jump out of airplanes and blow up tanks. Okay. But I never got to do, well, I got to jump out of the airplanes and I got to pretend to blow up a few tanks. But then I messed up my knees and they temporarily assigned me as a chaplain's assistant, which okay. everyone thought that just meant you would drive the chaplain around and file paperwork and clean, you know, set up the altar and that kind of stuff. But actually, it turns out a chaplain's assistant in the military is a counselor and they go okay. through like 18 months of training and a bunch of other stuff. And I didn't go through any of that. But the chap and I was working for was like, all right, in you go. So I was all of a sudden with no training other than my life experience, talking to people and giving advice. I was dealing with uh, the interfaith prayer group, the the AA group, the you know people who were thousands of miles away from their daughter on her 16th birthday, mm, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff, all the way up to suicidal ideation. With like, I was a 20 year old kid. Like all I could do was I learned how to ask questions. Like yes. Right. Dial up AOL was what the internet was back then. So oh, I remember I couldn't, that. I couldn't yeah. just go Google how to be a counselor. Right. right, so I, right. I had to learn it fast. So um, so that kind of got me started in the in the sort of counseling and, and coaching side of things. Eventually got uh, sent out to the or sent back to the United States, 
uh, regular unit would still had messed up knees. So they made me a training coordinator. So I learned how to do training for large groups of people and how to do a lot of the logistics behind that and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And then was medically discharged from the military because my knees never got better and went to work for the VA for a period of time where I was helping people who had been in the army for long periods of time, get out and, and, uh, adjust to civilian life. Sure. So, so people who'd been in for 10 years or more and had to be, you know, had to learn the fact that you can't just yell at people because you don't outrank them anymore, right? You don't have more weight on your collar or whatever. Um, but a lot of them wanted to be business owners. They're like, I'm going to get out. I'm going to start a, cons- I'm going to start a business. I'm going to become a consultant. I'm going to go right back doing the same job that I was doing for three times the price. Cause that's kind of how it sometimes works near me. And I was actually in Tennessee. It was, um, uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, right up there. Oh, sure. Uh, that's where, that's where I got out of the army. So, um, but I learned because I had all these, these soldiers that wanted to learn how to run businesses. I had to go learn how to start a business, how to run a business. So I could teach these people having never done it myself. Interesting. Before, obviously. Sure. Um, so did that for a while, then met a Canadian girl, moved to Canada and her father was in, um, financial services. And he asked me to come take a look at the financial services stuff that they were doing. And I had been studying at school and working on my degree in communications and some other stuff. But anyway, so he, he, he asked me to come take a look at their stuff and their training was, was terrible. It was, it was just terrible. Mm -hmm. And I found out later that it's the same training that everybody in the financial services industry gets. So the vast, like it's, it's, it's bad. Um, so he asked me what I would do to change it. And basically, long story short, I wrote him a, like a report and this is what I would change. This is how I would change it. He asked me if I would do it for him, um, <clears throat> kind of on the basis of you still want to date my daughter, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I went and helped his team and very quickly, it was a team of, they're all independent advisors. They were all business owners, basically. Um, and we worked with them and in about three months, they became the number two office in all of Canada for their company that they, okay. they worked in, whatever. So that was my first taste of sort of like, oh, I can train and I can teach and, and like in the private sector. Yep. Um, fast forward about a decade. Um, I have married his daughter. I have gone through a divorce with his daughter. I'm still working with him three companies later. And at this point, I am what they call a business owner succession planner. So business owners who were well, who were uh, looking to get out of their business would come to me and say, hey, I think I'm ready to sell my business. You know, what do we think it's going to be worth? How are we going to structure this so it's tax advantage and all this kind of fun stuff? And the vast majority of the time I had to tell them, you're not going to be able to sell your business. It's not a business. It's a job and a client list. Sure, sure. Right? And, and a bunch of inventory, perhaps, right? Yep. That needed to be sold. So what I would do is I would offer to work with them for free for six, 12, 18 months. And at the end of that time, we would have a business that they could sell. Mm-hmm. And some of them would say yes. And unfortunately, the majority of the ones that said yes, I worked with at the end, I was going to make like 50, $60,000 helping them with the sale and all the other kind of fun stuff. But by the time we would get to the end of it, they would say, actually, I don't want to sell my business anymore. Now it's this thing that because now it's making money. Now it's making money. It's yeah. not stressful. I don't have to be here if I don't want to. And so I was at that point, I had gotten so bad. And we can talk about this later if you want that in my personal life, I had been going through the divorce. I was sleeping on my office floor because I didn't like I was, you know, doing the stuff that that you do and, and being an entrepreneur and all that kind of fun stuff. And so I went down the hallway to my, my now ex-father-in-law's office and said, this isn't working. Like I've got, I had $80,000 in commissions walk out my office because I'd done too good of a job helping the guy build a good company. And I was starving to death and every penny I had was going to my ex-wife and kids, which is where it should have been going. Um, And uh, he said, well, why don't you charge for the business coaching stuff? And I, that was like a revelation. Why did I, why didn't I think of that? Right. Um, And there were reasons for it, but the short version is he suggested it. I did some thinking about it. um, And basically shortly after that entered in the world of business coaching. And, and while I was doing that, I met a whole bunch of other coaches. Uh, mm-hmm. Because the coaching world's fairly or was back then fairly small. The internet online coaching world wasn't there yet. Yeah. Um, and I met a lot of other coaches and life coaches, health coaches, nutritional, you know, like all that kind of stuff. And all of them were kind of struggling with their businesses and going through some of the same things that that I had been going through. And so I just started saying, well, why don't we do a mastermind? Why don't we do this? And just offering help. Yeah. And lo and behold, over the course of time, um, about half of my clients were were coaches. 
And one of my coaches and mentors said to me, why don't you actually plant your flag? And this was a couple of years ago. He said, why don't you plant your flag in the world of, of coaching? And yeah. I had always avoided it because the internet online coaching space is very icky. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to get any of that ickiness on me. And he said, no, that's why you need to plant your flag and, and be a coach for coaches because you need to give them all an alternative. So that's kind of how I, in 2000, what year is it now? Uh, 2020. 23. Yeah. <laughs> so in 2020, I launched, I launched the Profit for Coaches brand, the podcast and, and all that kind of fun stuff. And so I have focused primarily since then, still about 60, 70% of my, of my practices with other coaches and helping them to make their coaching practices profitable. Because I think good coaches and good consultants, typically they're brilliant at what they do, but they're not great business owners. Mm -hmm. And I think they need to be well, they don't need to be a good business owner. They need to have their business set up to support them so that they can focus on doing what they're good at. Because the more good and great coaches we have out there helping business owners, the better off everybody's going to be. Yeah, so good. Well, it's interesting because I'm thinking, so even though you know everyone listening, well, the majority of you all listening have some sort of inventory, mm -hmm. I know there are a lot of you listening that have a service component to your business as well. And I talk about how, that how great that is. If you can wrap in a service component, the margins are much better than, yes. than what is going on with the inventory. So if we can wrap that together, I'm thinking in particular, I had a client who did phenomenal window displays. Like these mm -hmm. were state of the art, like anthropology should hire her. And I said, why don't you teach other brick and mortar boutique real real estate um, or uh, retailers, excuse me, yep. how to do beautiful window displays? That's a type of coaching, consulting, service based. Yep. So, if things are starting to move um, in your mind and you're thinking, "Oh my goodness, this is going to be really interesting," what would you tell someone who is thinking about adding on a service component or has maybe just started? So, they have some sort of inventory based business and now they want another revenue stream where they're coaching, consulting, teaching. What are some things they need to think about as it relates to profitability? Hmm. As it relates to profitability, well, there's always the basics of who are you going who are you going to help. Being really specific about that that target market and making sure that you go after in a way that that you can manage. The other thing is treat your time the same way that Profit First treats money. So okay. pre allocate your time. So if you've got your you've got your brick and mortar, you've got your inventory based business that's doing its thing, it's still requiring some of your time, some of your attention. If you're going to add that service based component get real specific about what percentage of my work day or my work week, whatever it is, do I want to put into this and invest into this portion of my business? And then make sure you put those boundaries in place and you honor them, you know, yeah. the same way you don't, you know, borrow slash steal money from your tax account to pay uh, for your, your whatever. You don't borrow time from anywhere else to focus on this or from here to, to focus on that because you can't ever give it back. So you're stealing, right? So, yeah. so definitely focus that, be, be mindful of your time and be really, really specific about, you can help everyone with everything. I know that mm -hmm. all of us can, we're, we're brilliant at helping everyone with everything, whatever it is that our services can, if it's properly applied, no, just be really, really focused. In fact, the smaller you can make that, that target that when you're, first bringing it out, especially yeah. uh, the more specific, the more profitable you're going to wind up being. Um, lastly, I'd say in, invest in help. You know, if you haven't mm -hmm. been in that space, get a coach, get someone who's been in that space that can help you. It's one of the best investments that you'll ever make. Yeah. And then don't spend much more. Yeah. The, the service side can be incredibly lucrative. The margins can be as high as 85, 90% if you, depending on how you're, you're doing it and, and, and where you're going. Um, in fact, that should never be lower than 50% if you're, if you're doing it right. Um, but be careful because it's really easy to go, oh, well, the service side is making a ton of money. And yeah. then you go spend that money on, on the other side of the business or whatever. Yes. And, and yeah, that's not a good idea. Yeah. So that's, a, that's really interesting. We've been talking about that a lot lately in my mastermind group. Because a lot of my um, participants, mastermind participants have multiple revenue streams. And in fact, one said, you know, we keep hearing like you should have lots of revenue streams and lots of ways. To, and I said, who comes up with these things and just makes them <laughs> gospel? You know, you can't make any money for the first five years you're open. Yep. You know, all these things that we hear over and over. And I always say, says who? 
So mm -hmm. says yep. who we have to have five or six or seven multiple revenue streams when nothing is working well. And this one that was doing amazing is now supporting the other things. Yep. And so that can happen with service too, because we suddenly find ourselves with more cash flow. Yep. And so that can cover a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. So how does how would profit first help? Help that. So let's say we have an inventory based business. They have a really unique talent. They're going to add a service based um, revenue stream in with that unique talent. They're using profit first. How can they use profit first as a guardrail to not fall into that trap of now this is just going to pay for something that's not, it's not holding its own weight? Right. Well, there's a, a number of different ways that you could do it in profit first. One way would be to treat that branch of the company as a separate company. So open up a full different set of bank accounts. Okay. And run the the funds through there as a completely separate stream. Yep. Like so they little... would make their they could make their own budget. Yep. All of those things separately. It's a different company. It needs to support itself. Okay. It's, yep. Exactly. Okay. Um, so you can do it that way. Um, another thing you can do is you can you can create just a set sub account. So if you've got OpEx set up, um, then then just do the separation within there. If you don't want to do a complete new company setup with a different in, income, profit, et cetera, um, you just split your OpEx so that you've got your uh, your inventory side OpEx and a separate sub account for the service. So let's say it's, well, it's a window speaking, let's say it's, it's speaking or, or whatever it's going to be. Right. Um, so it's the speaking OPEX and it is only X percent or a set amount of money that you're allowed to invest in that. Um, now the challenge with doing it that way is that all the income is still going to come into the overall income account and your allocations are going to go. And you're going to be tempted. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're going to be tempted and you're going to have suddenly an extra, let's say it's an extra $10,000 a month that you're getting just from going and doing some, you know, some service stuff. Well, that goes into your income account. If you don't change the way you do your allocations, you're going to have extra money in your OPEX side and it's going to start covering for mm -hmm. the other side of the business without you even realizing it because you haven't separated it out. Yeah. Right? That's, that's why my first instinct would be to say, set it up as a separate separate set of accounts. Yeah. I really like that too. And I think, you know, if any of you listening have worked with me in any regard, we've worked on the budget piece mm -hmm. that I always bring in. And I, that's why I always ask like, what are your revenue streams? Okay. Well, I have a brick and mortar and online and pop-ups and we say, okay, let's create separate goals for all of those. And let's mm -hmm. really have a separate PNL, even if it's just class tracking some way to separate out and say, okay, my pop-ups actually cost me this much to run. My brick and mortar cost me this. So we would just do that again with yep. the service. But I like your idea of those different accounts because that cash doesn't lie. So when we see the cash, we can say, okay, it is supporting itself instead yep. of letting that bleed over. That's yep. so good. So tell us one of your most exciting success stories with Profit First. So a client that you've had where you've helped them and you just, it was a massive win for them. Um. Well, gosh, there's a, there's a ton and I get to cheat a little bit because I'm one of the guides for profit first in Canada. So I teach other profit first professionals what to do or how to, so you have how to more do stories. So I've got, it, I've got all kinds of stories. I'm like, do I want to do one of mine? Do I want to do one of theirs? Um, I think a simple, a simple, but exciting one is we had a, a, a lady who um, she was running a coaching business or a, an education business, not even necessarily a coaching business. She was having an education business and she really was her biggest challenge was that she get paid up front, right? So it's a, okay. it's a six month, six month coaching with her, whatever it is. And, and they'd pay her $10,000 up front or whatever it was for the, for the six months. And so every month she was running off of the cash that was coming in every month because she just mm, had okay. you know, the one account. So $10,000 comes in, $10,000 comes in. And the challenge was like most people who are doing primarily service-based, uh, she would have a month with not very many clients. So she'd go out and do a whole bunch of marketing and sales and she'd pick up 10, 15 clients and, and fill her calendar and they would all pay up front. And so she'd have a great, all of a sudden there's this massive boost of, of money in her bank account. And then she'd, she'd use that to catch up on her bills and her line of credit. And then yeah. she'd live on that. But the problem is that massive chunk of money, really the way that she spent it only lasted her for about three months. Sure. But the problem is she's committed to these 15 clients for six months. Yeah. And so now she doesn't have the time to go out and get new clients to pay mm -hmm. her. She's got, she's got to do three months of delivery on these people and she has no money. 
So now she's back to living off, you know, her, her line of credit starts cranking up. Uh, she's late on her credit card, like all those things. So now she gets the end of that three months, you know, the six months with the clients, three months of no real income. Um, yeah. And now she's tied up against it and she's got to go immediately into launching another group. And that cycle just kept continuing and continuing. And so we sat down and one of the parts of, of Profit First that most people don't know a whole lot about is called the drip account. And so mm -hmm. when we sat down, we installed Profit First first, okay. um, you know, the basics first. And then we said, well, because you're taking all your money up front, let's do a drip account. And basically the summary of the drip account is we put all the money in the drip account first and we say, okay, this money's got to last us six months. So we divide mm -hmm. it by six or 12, depending on how many times you do your allocations. And you only take that much out each month. And okay. then you allocate that money down through the system. And so that made it a bit, it, when we first put it in place, it didn't help her feel like she had a ton more money because it was all in that account, but she was just sort of eking it out. And it, it so she, she had to pay back her debts more slowly. She had to do because, yeah. right. So, and it's, and it's tough. We had to teach her to, to not just grab that money, throw it at the problem, but to actually treat it like here we're going. And in doing that, we stabilized her income, her each month so she had it and we'd also freed up so she didn't have to go out and get 15 clients at once she yeah. could spread it out and be consistently doing her marketing every month so she was bringing on like one new one two new clients a month so she was consistently sitting at that 12 to 15 clients but as yeah. two or three would come off she could add two or three on it so um that allowed her to be much more just much less stressed Mm -hmm. uh, she could be more present and doing the things that she was, she knew she was confident in how much money she had. And from there, then she started making smarter decisions about how she was spending that money. It's not like, oh, in six yeah. months, I'm going to have 80 grand in my chunk. account. Yeah. Yep. It's so that made her get um, uh, more consistent with how she was doing that, make some smarter decisions. Then she realized, oh, I can be more efficient with this. I can let go of that. And within, I think it was 14 months, 15 months. She was making more money than she'd ever made in her life, as well as have had a higher profit margin, was less stressed. She'd gone from like 60 hours a week, pulling her hair out to 30, 35 hours a week. You know, 25 of that was with clients. The rest was just kind of turning the crank on the business. And um, yeah, basically she said, this has completely changed my life. I was ready to quit, quit my business, quit what I was doing and go back and, and find a job. Um, actually she was, she was close to declaring bankruptcy just mm -hmm. because of how things have been stacking up. So that's, yeah. that's one of the wins that, that, that we like a lot because yeah. it's, it's one that we actually replicate a lot. Yeah. Um, coaches so and, a couple of things I want to pull out of that yeah. first, you said 14, 15 months. I want mm -hmm. everyone to listen to that. You don't just set up profit first bank accounts and then it just fixes everything the next month. And I think mm -hmm. it's really good for us to remember that it, just like it took us a bit of time to get into trouble, it's going to take us a bit of time to back out of that and put good disciplines in place. I was talking to a client yesterday. We just set up her budgets. We set up her profit first. We set up her buying budget. And she's like, this is so painful. I just want to go out and just buy the things. Yep. I just want to go to market. I just want to buy. But the budget says I can't and I don't need it, you know. And so yeah. I said, first of all, thank you for telling me that. Like, thank you for being honest that it is painful. Yeah. It's you're exercising a completely new muscle. And that muscle's like, if it's even there, it's atrophied. Like we have to build strength into it. We need to put the right nutrition. And that just takes time. Yep. And so being consistent. So I love that you shared with us. It took her like a year and a half, you know, but the reward is great. The next thing is I have a lot of clients that do drop shipping and mm -hmm. pre-orders. And we've talked about drip accounts for that because they'll do a pre-order. So they put a t-shirt online, they sell a hundred of them, they collect mm -hmm. all the money, but it's not going to come in. And I always say, don't spend that money nope. until those products are delivered because that person could go out of business. They could short ship you. And then, oh mm -hmm. my goodness, I've spent that. And you're in a really bad position. So a drip account would be perfect for something like that, where they collect the money it's like a holding account. They save that money over there. They don't do their profit first allocations off of it or anything. It's like, it doesn't exist yep. until the transaction's completed. Um, do you see that working the same way? Any thoughts for us on that? Cause I, we talk about that a lot in my group. Yeah. Um, so with, with that, I, I might consider doing that as a sort of a modified mats and subs account rather than okay. a pure drip because yep. the drip where it would work where the drip account would work for that is if you had, say they had milestones, right? Okay. So 
I've, I've put the, the shirt out. I know that at this point, I'm going to need 10%. At this point, I'm going to need to pay 25 at this mm. point, right? Et cetera. Because the purpose of the drip account is to, there's a spreadsheet that we do with it that tells us this money has to last over X number of allocations. So we are spending it along the way. Yeah. So that would be different. So this could almost yeah. be a separate cost of goods sold account yeah. or inventory account is how I have them set up where yeah. pre-orders, drop shipping, that money collected goes into your inventory account B, the inventory you own when that sells, that goes over here. Cause that starts the roll down right away where the other yeah. money has to sit. Okay. Yeah. 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 See, there's so many creative ways you can use profit first. Oh yeah. Absolutely. I always say there's like two non-negotiables. You have to set up bank accounts and you have to be consistent. Aside yep. from that, there's a lot of options yep. to tailor it to your business. So tell us about a client story where they just weren't successful with profit first. They gave up. They were discouraged. You had really high hopes for what you could help them with. And it just didn't work out. Gotcha. I don't really have any client stories like that, believe it or not, because most of my clients, we managed to fix it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a large number of, of stories where a client will come to me and we started setting things up and then they went a little sideways or they didn't tell me something. Yeah. Um, we had a, a, this is actually a roofing company that uh, we went through almost the entire year together and we set everything up and we were, things seemed to be going really well. And it was only at the end of the year and the end of the season that he sat down and he said, he said, um, I actually went and looked at the way I've been costing out the jobs yeah. and the jobs cost me 70%. I've only got a 30, well, 32% um, gross profit margin on the roofing jobs. Yeah. And I'm like, he's like, this is a, is this a problem? I'm like, what do you, well, it depends. Yeah. If you put the 70, if you, if you put the 70, whatever, or the 68% in mats and subs, it's fine. Cause all that just comes out per job. Everything's good. If you can run your company and pay yourself and pay your taxes on the 31% that's left or 32% that's left. And he said, yeah, that's the problem. I can't. Yeah. And I'm like, well, that would explain. And he's like, yeah, we just took <laughs> it. We just, we, we just took out an $80,000 loan at the end of the yeah. year to pay off all of our suppliers and everything. I'm just like, dude, yeah. like, why didn't you? Okay. But we sat down we said, okay, that's cool because profit first lets you see this. He never would have seen yeah. any of this. If he had just kept going, even if he had done the the job costing the way that he did at the end of the year and realized 70% of every job was, was going right back out the door, um, he still wouldn't have had the breakdown. Now, I need 15% for taxes. I need this percent for this. I need this percent for that. So it was having that in place that allowed him to go, oh, okay, this isn't going to work. I need to raise my prices yeah. and, and and change my bidding. So it turned into a success story. Um, we still have another meeting at the beginning of the quarter. We're going to do his annual review and all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and it's, I think it's going to be positive, but it was just, we were doing things right. And I couldn't understand why he kept coming back with, well, we're just a little negative. We're just a little late. Yeah. Like, and anyway, he, but that would, that's probably the, the most recent sort of almost failure that. Yeah. Um, and you just didn't have the right information. Yeah. I was just talking like literally today, just on a client call, same problem, but it's inventory. So mats mm -hmm. and subs, we replaced that with inventory cost yep. of goods sold. And so same thing <laughs> I looked, I said, pull up your, I, let me see your PL. Like this is, yep. let me see your PL. and And I said, oh goodness sakes, you know, so you have whatever 50,000 in sales and $10,000 in cost of goods sold. I'm like, now, well, I would be thrilled for you with that margin. <laughs> I know that's not accurate. But because she didn't understand cost of goods sold and that it's not what I just went and spent in materials, it's what the cost Ooh. of those sales were, yep. she was entering all of the expense of the inventory versus costing what actually sold. And so her margins showed so high. So she was oh. making massive transfers and then running out of money and not enough mm. to buy it with inventory. So yes, it's all about really understanding what do the numbers mean and that mats or subs or cost of goods has to be accurate because yep. you can't run off of a gross margin or real revenue that's inaccurate. You'll run into yep. a lot of problems. Yep. Yeah. And it's it's interesting for me to get them started. I don't necessarily need, give me five years of P&Ls and all of your, but like, I'm fine with bring me 12 months of your bank, of your, your bank statements and credit card statements. So we'll go through item by item and we'll go, this goes in this bucket, this goes in this bucket and we'll pull that out at the end of it. And, and we'll start with something rough. Yeah. Because within six months, we'll know where everything, where all the inaccuracies were. Yeah. Because we'll watch it and, and the red flags will pop. And that lets us go, okay, here's a spot of your business that we can make better. Yeah, um, so but, good. But within that that first year, 
you've got to get your numbers clean. Yes. Yes. And that means you also need to communicate with a bookkeeper. That's not giving you accurate numbers. Yes. (laughs) So she said to me, it was so, she's like, why do they do this? (laughs) <laughs> and I said, well, I'm just, you know, I don't know. I don't even know who her bookkeeper is. I said, some of it's laziness, honestly, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's extra entries to put the inventory on the balance sheet first and then move over what's sold. People are lazy. Some of it is just, they don't understand. If they yeah. don't work with inventory, they don't understand. You don't expense inventory out until it's sold. <laughs> like yep. it's an asset. So that's really important too. If you feel like you're not getting accurate financials. And so you're feeling this disconnect with profit first, like let's figure out what the missing pieces are because it could quite possibly just be numbers that aren't giving you the right information to make those. Can I just, just real quick on that? Yeah. Cause I work with literally, I know hundreds of them. I work with dozens of bookkeepers. Some of them are profit first, some of them aren't, and they're all great human beings, but here's the thing. The vast majority of bookkeepers get started like this. Their partner, typically a husband starts a business. Mm Mm-hmm they're a tradesperson or something like that. And they decide to go out on their own. And they're like, my wife can do the books. Yep. And so they start by doing that. And it's usually a service-based or one small thing. And, and they start with something small. And then they realize, yep. hey, I'm making, I could make some money doing this for some other people, mm-hmm. uh, particularly my husband's friends, whose wives have all said, I'm not doing your books. Yep. Right. And so they sort of branch out that way. And so they come from one set of experience and once, and, yeah. and, a lot of them will go out and get more training and things like that. And that's, that's great. That's helpful. That's awesome. But sometimes they're just coming from a place where they don't know what they don't know. Yeah. Where the inventory, like the idea of inventory is just, I mean, it should be there for tradespeople because parts is a thing and tools are a thing, yeah. but for a lot of times it's not, or they just, they just don't try. It doesn't occur to them and yeah. it's not because they're bad people. It's not because they're mm-hmm. ripping you off. It's just, they don't know. Yeah. They don't know. They're like, Oh, that was $1,200 on your credit card at market. We'll yep. just put it in as an expense. No, no, no. Mm-hmm. It's uh, it's an asset. So we got to put it in the right place. Yeah. yeah. But I have found, I will say for anyone who's like, oh, this is so frustrating. That's my bookkeeping experience. What do I do? I would say 99% of the time, if I'm working with a client and I say, here's what we need and here's how we're going to communicate that to your bookkeeper, they are more than willing to do it accurately. They, like you said, they just didn't know. So once in a while, you get someone who fights you on it. And then you need to look at someone who can actually help you in your own industry because you need accurate financials. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they'll say, oh, wow, absolutely. I can enter it that way. No problem. So, and then they'll quietly go make the change on half of their other clients Yes, and say, Oh, maybe they won't notice. And they won't because most people aren't looking at their financials, but that needs to be another podcast for another day. Absolutely. <laughs> oh my I, I would just say, if you, if you're struggling with your bookkeeper, you can ask Sierra, um, or you can ask any of us profit first professionals because we know a ton of them. Yes. And we yes. know the ones that are really good and that are taking those extra steps. And there are a bunch of them that are Profit First certified that are familiar yeah. with how Profit First works and are just happy as clams to work on somebody's books that's doing Profit First because they already know how it all works. Yes. And that's just such a good point to leave with everyone. If you're also struggling with your accountant or bookkeeper pushing back on Profit First, mm-hmm. um, I've had a couple of those where they just fight the client. I think, goodness sakes, you know, <laughs> if people want to manage their cash in their own business, let them do that. But if you're finding that, then it's probably fine, time to find a Profit First type bookkeeper or accountant, someone who knows it and who will gladly help you set up those accounts and manage your cash because they want you to win and make more yeah. money. And keep more money. Yeah. Yes. So good. Okay. What is one word of advice that you could give that maybe a mentor or a fellow profit first professional, someone has told you along your journey, that's just made such an impact in the way that you run your business. Oh gosh, there's lots. Um, I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, probably the, the biggest one, um, I'm, I'm going to go with Dan Sullivan. I'm going to go with who, not how, um, one of the biggest mistakes that we tend to make, especially those of us who are knowledge people and and in the coaching or service business is we think I can just figure out how to do this. Um, I just got to figure out how, how do I make this happen? How do I get this done? I'll, I'll, I'll create an extra 10 hours a day and figure out how to do this. When quite often the best possible thing you can do is instead find a who. Find another person that can do this for you, that can get it done, especially if there's something you're procrastinating on. Usually that's not a sign of a character flaw. That's a sign of this is a thing that you could benefit from if it was done right, but Mm -hmm. you're not the person to do it. Mm 
And especially when it comes to leadership, like step one, get a coach, get somebody who can help you walk you through, guide you through and say, yeah, you do need help with, you do need a specialist who can do this here. Or you know what? No, you can do this yourself. Can help you sort of uh, make those decisions on who can help me get what I want versus how do I do this myself? Yeah. So good. Okay. What book have you read recently? that you'd like to share and it can be a novel self-help business book and Um, if you're not a reader a podcast too oh i'm a huge reader um okay and and i do listen to podcasts there's always mine um yes uh who not how actually is a book that dan sullivan um and uh benjamin hardy wrote together um that and the book that they wrote after that called uh the gap in the game those two books together oh yes that's so good Yeah, yeah i think those would fundamentally help a business owner, an entrepreneur who's struggling with, you know, I'm not where I want to be yet. Um, and you're, we're, we're always like, Oh, I'd love to, I'd love to have that next collection that I can sell or bring in this next line of inventory. And and we're looking at going on, but I haven't, it's like, well, stop a second. How far have you come? What have you like, just spend a couple of minutes in the game, looking at where you've come from, and then you can feel better about, okay, now how do I tackle the gap and the thing that's in front of, so those two books together, I think are that gap and gain book was Mind blowing. <laughs> when I read that, I was like, that's what my problem's been for, you know, because a lot of us as entrepreneurs, we are overachievers and we really struggle with celebrating and living in our wins. And yep. the wins and celebrating those wins is actually what propels us to do greater and greater things. And when we don't understand why we can't live in that and how far we've come, that was yeah, really, really good book. Um, Okay. So here's what I want everyone to do I want you to listen to Joss's podcast. So I tell everybody in my sphere, all my clients, that it's really important that we step out of our own industry mm-hmm. and we we look at what other industries are doing and how we can bring that into what we're doing to be a disruptor, to yes. revolutionize the way that we're doing business. So I think listen listening to Josh's podcast where he's talking to other coaches and he's talking about, we'll get you out of the retail industry, the inventory industry, and give you some new and fresh perspectives on how to do things. So the name of your podcast is? Profit for Coaches. Profit for Coaches. Okay. So we can all remember that. I'm going to drop it in the show notes. Um, Anything else you want to share? Anywhere else people can find you where you want to direct our listeners? Um, Well, I'm on, I'm on the interwebs in a number of different places. LinkedIn, um, as far as social media goes, um, my wife does an amazing job of posting little clips from my, uh, from my podcast on my, uh, Facebook and my, uh, Instagram. Okay. Um, so if people want just like 30 second chunks, uh, yeah. great. You can go find that. But, but really, if you like profit for the profit for okay. coaches podcast, you can find on any podcast, anywhere you get your podcasts. Okay. Um, those are the best places to find me probably. And, um, yeah, that's, I'm, I'm pretty simple. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Yeah, I think it would be a really great listen. Um, he interviews really interesting people and then you have your own episodes as well. So listen to the podcast and um, yeah, and then connect with Joss if you have questions about business. I'm sure as a profit first professional, he would love to help you or direct you in the right, direct you to the right place. So thanks so much for joining me today. Well, thanks for having me. I love our conversations. I know it was great. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Inventory Genius Podcast. Um, If you have not um, made your way over to my website, we just did a big revamp. A lot of great information over at sierrastockland.com. My podcast is listed there along with blogs and information, places that I've been on other podcasts, articles, a lot of good things, um, along with some good resources like Profit First for Retail. So head on over to sierrastockland.com. Please connect with me. And I will see you all next week. Bye for now. Hey friend, thank you so much for tuning in today to the Inventory Genius Podcast. If there's something that you heard today on the podcast episode and you want to dig deeper into becoming an inventory genius yourself, I want to invite you to head on over to my website, sierrastockland.com, where I have multiple ways that you and I can work together on your inventory. I want to help you with your profit, your cash flow, and your paycheck because at the end of the day, it's all related to your inventory. So head on over to the website, connect with me. I'll work with you soon. See you then. Hey there, friend. If you like what you've been learning here on the Inventory Genius Podcast, then you are going to love my Quick Start to Inventory Genius course. 
If you're a product-based business owner and you've been trying to figure out how to make more money, create more profit, and just keep more cash, then the quick start is for you. It's a minimal investment. And here's what I promise you. In fact, here's what I guarantee you. If you take the quick start and I don't help you make twice your investment back, I will refund your quick start enrollment in full. So you have nothing to lose. The quick start inventory genius combines every method that I teach into a simple bite-sized actionable step. Yes, one step that will help you create more profit and keep more cash in your business. So here's what I want you to do. Head on over to sierrastockland.com and click on the quick start. That's sierrastockland.com and click on the quick start to inventory genius. I promise you this will be some of the best money you have spent all year. Now let's get back to the show.